Hi folks, Peps here, I hope you're well. Um, I'm just going to do a quick video today uh, reviewing kind of the research over the last academic year since summer 2023 to summer 2024. Um, so I'm going to look at five kind of big themes and a few papers that exemplify each of those themes. Um, and that's pretty much it, so let's dive in. Now, just to kind of give you a sense of where I'm coming from with all of this, when I set up Evidence Snacks, oh gosh, 18 months ago or so, uh, I essentially wanted to help teachers to keep up to date with the evidence in just a few minutes a week. And so to do that, what I do is I have a number of different kind of streams that uh, allow me to have access to kind of the best research related to education that's out there. So I uh, look at about 30 uh, high quality journals. I have like a Twitter feed, which kind of connects me to lots of evidence informed kind of people as it were. And then I have a bunch of like Google Scholar alerts. And so between all of those, that gives me a sense of like the, the kind of latest research that's coming out each week. And then I try and distill uh, or basically pick out some of the best papers each week and you know, post them on evidence stacks. Those of you who subscribe will know. And if you don't subscribe, then go and check it out. So how do I select um, or how do I choose the papers to share? Well, I kind of got three criteria. The first is relevance. So uh, there's a lot of research, loads of research out there that really isn't all that relevant, I think, to teachers in the classroom. Um, and so it's basically, you know, using my professional judgment to pick out things that I think will be, you know, relevant, which will have implications for practice and which will be interesting. Um, the second criteria is rigor. Um, so I will be looking for, you know, methodology, methodologies that are sound, you know, have decent sample sizes. Um, and ideally hint at some causality because what we want is to be able to understand the consequences of our decisions in the classroom. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, uh, all of the papers that I share are open source because uh, I think it's just important that teachers are able to read the kind of raw material, um, but also so that we can kind of um, nudge the system to be publishing more open in the future because really that's where we want things to be headed. So just a quick overview uh, before we kind of dive into those themes. Um, I have looked at, I think, 5,000, around about 5,000 papers over the last 12 months or so, and I have picked out and shared about 240, uh, like I said, r r relevant and rigorous ones. And so that works out to be around about five a week, something like that. And these come from a variety of different sources. Um, and as you can see here, uh, Educational Psychology Review uh, has got a large proportion of those that I've shared. Uh, Ed Working Papers is also really popular. Uh, as is nature, science of learning. Um, learning and instruction is one of my particular favourites, but you know, as you can see there, there's a, you know, a, a bit of a distribution. So what kinds of themes have emerged across that kind of research over the last year? Well, for me, the first big theme has been the kind of counterintuitive role of practices which either inhibit or catalyse inequity in the classroom. For example, a study by Schoenwelt in September, uh, which looked at about 100 primary school children um, and teacher inflated praise uh, and how it affected the perceptions of students from low socioeconomic you know, status backgrounds or disadvantaged students. And essentially what they found was that teachers uh, gave more inflated praise to disadvantaged students more than they did less disadvantaged students. Uh, and as a result, children then perceived their peers uh, who received inflated praise as less smart um, although more hardworking, which basically reinforces negative stereotypes, making um, disadvantaged students seem less capable. So like a really good example of how, you know, be despite best intentions, uh, sometimes the things that we can kind of do in the classroom can inadvertently, um, like, you know, create inequity between students, which of course we don't want. Um, you know, a similar kind of study around inequity by Muskins in March, um, analysed over you know, 5 million student maths test results from I think over 50 countries um, to see how you know, students from you know, different socioeconomic status groups performed when it came to maths questions featuring real world challenges or not featuring real world situations and essentially what they found was that um, disadvantaged student, students scored I think something like 16 to 18 percent lower on questions which included real life uh, situations compared with you know more general maths questions um, and so you know this again I think for, can be a little bit counterintuitive and suggest that uh, you know teachers schools and you know, particularly exam boards just got to be really careful when you know thinking about the inclusion of 
um, you know, real world context in mathematical questions. And then the kind of final one just to call out around inequity was a study done by Sierskma in September uh, and they conducted three experiments um, on you know, reasonably early years children, children aged six to nine, and how they helped their peers. And what they found was that um, basically children are more inclined to offer empowering help. So that means like giving hints to their competent peers, whereas less competent peers receive non-empowering help, direct answers. And so basically uh, there's this tendency among students to reinforce competence-based inequalities that I think is really important that we as teachers are aware of and try to kind of stem a little bit. Um, now this last study was conducted in, in the lab setting, um, so probably needs to be replicated in a classroom setting in order to be able to you know, really build the case for that. But you know, I think uh, it sort of starts to feed into this general theme around uh, inequity and the kind of counter, sometimes counterintuitive practices which, which can lead to it. The second big theme um, was one around motivation. Essentially, you know, researchers are increasingly seeing motivation as a significant issue and a complex issue, and that there are lots of variables involved. You know, you need somebody to write a book on this at some point. Um, and they, as part of this, um, we're starting to see a kind of strain of research which uh, looks at the association or links relationships between motivation and you know, learning, for example. Uh, in particular, I'd like to call out a couple that link motivation and retrieval practice because I think this is really fascinating. And so one study by Endress in December um, basically conducted two experiments with, I think this was you know, nearly 200 undergraduate students to be fair um, uh, and what they found was that you know while retrieval as we are aware generally has a pretty positive effect the effect was weaker for students who had high levels of intrinsic motivation to begin with and I think the kind of underlying potential suggested mechanism here is that um, when we're more motivated we put in more attention during the kind of initial phases phases of learning and as a result retrieval practice doesn't have as great an effect and of course, this was conducted in, like I said, uh, an undergrad, undergrad university setting. Uh, so we you know, we'll probably need to replicate that in the school based setting before we like, do too much about it. However, we're starting to see the general idea being replicated. Um, so there was a, a similar study done by Farrell in May where they looked at teacher professional development. Uh, and they were you know, basically helping teachers to try and get better by providing them with videos to analyze. And what they found was that those teachers who were most interested in the kind of like the teaching and getting better essentially didn't benefit as much from the quizzing function as part of that professional development. So again, we see this mechanism of attention uh, sitting between kind of motivation and retrieval practice, basically like mediating the, the kind of effectiveness of retrieval practice, which I think is super interesting. The third big theme that uh, kind of seen starting to, to bubble up a little bit more than previously is the role or the power of knowledge, I suppose, or knowledge rich curricula. And um, so, you know, the big study was sort of done last summer by Grissomer uh, and colleagues, I think, including Dan Willingham. And they evaluated the kind of longer term effect of uh, what's called a core knowledge curriculum, which is essentially a, like a general knowledge curriculum for, uh, you know, early years over in the US. Um, I think involving over 2,000 students in a variety of, of uh, charter schools. And what they found was essentially that those students who attended uh, these core knowledge schools um, showed significant gains in reading and like English language. Um, and those gains persisted right through to their like third uh, and up to sixth grade. And with particularly strong effects for uh, the most disadvantaged students. And then we have a similar study by Kim in March where they looked at the kind of effect of a spiraled content literacy intervention in I think about 30 uh, primary schools with you know, almost 3,000 students. Um, and what they found was that those students who participated outperformed those in the control group, uh, not only in science vocabulary, which was the focus of the intervention, but also general reading comprehension and mathematics. Um, and those effects again persisted uh, like over several years. And so all in all, this kind of, you know, starts to build the case for the, you know, the power of a knowledge rich curriculum, particularly in the early years. And then the fourth big theme is really that there are, for me, an increased number of studies that are looking at effective teacher development at a more granular level, which I think is great. 
and it's probably largely a result of the kind of Sims and Fletcher Wood paper, which uh, you know was published in a journal this year, but was published previously as part of the Education Endowment Foundation systematic review of PD. Um, and as a result, we see papers like the Manzanito and Hill paper, which looked at uh, you know which compared modelling and rehearsal. Uh, as a way to improve teachers compared to discussion and reflection found that you know, modeling rehearsal is way more effective which was good news for uh, us over at Step Lab because that's a really big part of the theory of change that we have over at Step Lab um, in terms of helping teachers to get better. And then the final theme unsurprisingly is around the role of tech uh, and learning and we are increasingly seeing that um, tech can be counterproductive when it comes to learning. Um, for example, a study by Abrahamson uh, in February looked at the effect of smartphone bans on the mental health and academic outcomes of over 150,000 students in Norway. And they found that basically you know, suppressing availability of smartphones, either through bans or other, me other methods, significantly improved mental health, particularly of girls, um, significantly improved learning, particularly those from uh, more disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, reduce bullying for everyone and so essentially it's good that like multiple jurisdictions are you know really seriously considering uh, like you know, reducing the availability of smartphones in schools um, and of course you know it's been a big year for AI um, but we're starting to see some really interesting kind of counterintuitive effects of AI when it comes to learning so for example Bastani in July did a study where they looked at the effects of chat GT chat GTP tutors um, on the learning of a uh, thousand um, secondary school students and what they found was that while those students using the like chatbot tutors perform better on practice problems uh, in the moment their actual exam results worsened um, without the support of the AI so basically it seems that AI uh, you know can be helpful in the short term but detrimental in the long term it kind of acts as this de-skilling function um, so no doubt we'll see lots more studies on AI uh, over the next year or so. So all in all those are the big five themes that have emerged for me um, from the research over the last year or so. Um, I think it's pretty exciting uh, the education research space is reasonably healthy uh, I think if we were to wish for anything it would just be more and even better quality studies um, you know, I don't think there's any reason we can't. We have, you know, 130 unis in the UK alone, and with an average, I don't know, of like 15 to 20 uh, academic staff, we're looking at about 2,000 um, educational researchers in the UK alone. Um, and so, you know, if we were able to pull that body of researchers together and provide a kind of more co coordinated approach around a central research agenda, focusing on like the core decisions that teachers face around curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, behaviour and motivation uh, and then provide the incentives to support all of that um, because you know, high quality research is not cheap then I think we you know, stand to see uh, an even stronger pipeline of effective educational research that can help us to be even more effective in the classroom. So that is my general summary of the educational research over the last academic year. Let me know if you think this video is useful and I'll you know, do some more of them in the future. If you are interested in keeping up to date with the evidence, then just head over to Evidence Snacks and sign up. And if you want to go full geek and have access to the journal library, which has all of these studies, all 250 that we've talked about today, um, as well as weekly 100 word article summaries and much, much more, then uh, yeah, convince your school to sign up to Snacks Pro. And I will love to see you there. All right. Have a great week. Catch you later.